Hello, everyone. Um, I was asked to come up with a talk for the event on the theme of when stories collide. And among the, I mean, I, I'm usually not given a theme, um, which is kind of fine and all, but you end up saying the same thing. Half the time you end up talking about yourself, which is great, you know, but I, I, I liked this because the question was kind of, it poked me, you know. What, sto what stories colliding am I actually involved in? What stories colliding do I actually see all the time? Um, both of these terms, look, I've got a laser. That makes me feel important up here. Both of these terms, cypherpunks and biohackers, you've probably never heard of them. Now, to have not heard of biohacking, you either have to have been in a cave or Ireland, because it's been featuring in you know, global news all the time for the last three or four years under various titles. Um, cypherpunks, though, have gone completely under the radar for 30 odd years, maybe. And we owe so much to them that we don't yet appreciate. Um, we may never fully appreciate what we owe to these guys because they're not very media friendly. Some of them are downright media hostile. Um, but the, in the stories of these two kind of with this new movement of biohacking, which I will introduce, and this old movement, which I will also introduce, where they collide, is really interesting because stories repeat. And the cypherpunk story is repeating albeit in slow motion and hopefully to a lesser extent than the one that was seen with their forebears. So I say remaking the oldest technology with lessons from the newest because biotechnology is the oldest technology humans have. Possibly we were playing with rocks before we domesticated anything. But domestication was what, what they called the grand agricultural experiment. Biotechnology is the oldest thing there is. We, we took control of our own ecology for better or worse and we started developing species which we live off. Um, so when it comes to discussing what biohacking is, it's important to know that this is, it, it is and it isn't new. Sometime in the last few hundred years, we, um, we, we stopped kind of treating biotechnology as a cottage industry. It used to be that you owned what you grew, or you ate what you grew, or you lived with what you grew, or perhaps you were what you grew. In some sense, we selected for ourselves, we engineered ourselves. But in the last few hundred years, it ended up being where some other guy does the job of breeding, does the job of hybridizing, more recently does the job of genetic engineering. They're all just steps along the path of uh, biotechnology, which we've been doing for thousands of years, but we're no longer involved. And that's led to a disenfranchisement, disenfranchise, disenfranchisement. I can pronounce that off stage. It leads, to a, it leads to a feeling of us versus them, it leads to distrust, it leads to fear. And you see this when people are terrified of genetically modified crops. What are they gonna do to my children? Absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. They're totally harmless. But you don't know that because you don't actually interact with them. It's not your fault. It's, it's the way that the world now works. And this movement has started in the last 10 years. You might say the impetus was there beforehand, but it's only possible recently, where people are saying, no, no I, I, I don't want to have to go to university for 10 years just so that I can interact with the things that I utterly depend on, the medicines, the foods, uh, the companion animals, uh, using modern technology. I want to do that at home. And that happened with computers. Um, it, it, the computer revolution was when people said, those things that you guys are playing with in a white room, I'd like to take one of those home and see what I could do with it. And look what it's done to us. Look what it's done to this stage. Um, now, you may have heard, I said, you know, uh, about biohacking under different titles. Oh, it's the laser button. Uh, or maybe it was my help. No, it's those gentlemen up there. Um, <laughs> see, my self-aggrandizing laser button. Um, you may have heard of DIY bio. Um, because that has been a, a media-friendly topic. I just want to say biohacking is a subtitle. I don't want to claim everything about DIY bio in this talk. DIY bio is DIY bio, not necessarily biotech. It's just the DIY approach to citizen science. What biohacking is, is the, is the molecular end, where we say, okay, what about DNA? What about protein? What about all that stuff that used to be, still is invisible, but used to be inaccessible? I want to play with that. Why do we do it? We do it for fun, we do it to learn, we do it to enlighten others. Um, down in Cork, I was able to isolate glow-in-the-dark bacteria from fresh seaweed in the local uh, English market using only ingredients and equipment bought in the supermarket. It's actually surprisingly easy, and those guys have this lovely pale blue glow just constantly runs. You don't, they, they actually don't like the light. It's not about absorbing and re-emitting. This is true bioluminescence. You turn off the light and they just glow there happily as long as you feed them, um, which is for about a day, and then they get sick and die. Um, like glowing hamsters. Um, so, yeah, but it, it goes more than just the laugh, you know? I mean, the, the genetic science that, we, that heals us and that feeds us, we're also the products of an exquisite code that's been given, us to us, given to us by our ancestors for, you know, countless millions of years. And only recently has the ability to actually decode that data emerged, and only more recently has that 
power come into our hands. And this is a lovely screenshot, it's actually very unclear, I'm afraid, of some guys in, I think they were at a maker fair in America, um, showing people how to do a genetic test for the gene that allows you to taste Brussels sprouts. You ever had that conversation where you're like, I don't know if I can taste it, what's it like tasting it? I don't know, it just tastes like Brussels sprouts, you know? It's cool, now you can, you can test it. People may do it for art. Uh, art was actually the original kind of field in which the term biohacking was coined, but oddly enough, it didn't develop from them into its modern form. It sort of you know, collided. Um, that could be as whimsical as making genetically modified bacteria into a little picture of a kind of a sunset. This is the Centre for the Organisms of the European Union. Um, no, organi the post-natural organisms of Europe, uh, an exhibition held by Richard Pell, and that explores the organisms we've created and interact with in Europe. Um, next slide. Well, maybe it is later. We try to create tools that allow other people to get involved in biotechnology, to, um, to actually do the stuff that is supposedly too expensive or too difficult for people to get involved with. And like this is a, D a, a thermocycler, a PCR machine used for copying, modifying, pasting DNA. Used to be thousands of euro, now it's a couple of hundred euro, thanks to you know biohackers. Dremelfuge is my own little fun. You've heard about 3D printers a couple of times today. You can get a, if you can get access to a 3D printer, you can print a centrifuge, which normally costs a few hundred euro, for um, you know about a euro's worth of plastic. And now we're working on the open source DNA. We want to make it easy for you to make amazing things in life like people always used to. Um, and we, for that, you need to have DNA that is easy for you to work with at home. And we get together and we hold biohacker spaces where people can get together and teach one another, share equipment, share experiences, and make great things happen. Now, who, who founded DIY Bio is another question. This guy, I probably don't have the time to actually discuss, unfortunately, but he was one of the first guys to coin the term biohacking, and he was one of the first guys to encounter the political backlash against people taking bio, uh, biotech into their own hands, Steve Kurtz. Um, and cypherpunks, strange, you know, uh, kind of unfortunate that I went over time on this one, but uh, some of the founder population that created the biohacking uh, groups were actually computer hackers who just got interested. And among them were cypherpunks who had um, an interest in allowing everyone to have free speech and autonomy and immunity from, from government censorship and government surveillance, which is extremely topical now because they were fighting to prevent what we are now living under, a mass surveillance state, especially in the internet. And the big thing was encryption for all. Most people don't appreciate why that's important, but how do you know that your credit card isn't getting read by someone when you buy something over the internet? Cypherpunks did that, it used to be illegal. And these are um, you know, some examples of the hardware that are used to enforce that surveillance state. And you know, those things are dotted all over the Northern Hemisphere. They record every single thing that you do online. Actually, there are more modern versions of those, and much smaller and more invisible. Um, these guys, uh, here's a case study, uh, Nadine Kobaisi, only recently made a chat program that was designed to allow people to communicate freely and anonymously online. Now, it's beta grade, you couldn't necessarily trust it yet, we're still working out bugs, but just for creating that software, he's been detained at borders, he's had his passport seized temporarily while they interrogate him, without charge. They've asked him to install government backdoors, and they attempted to entrap him, which is actually illegal in most, um, you know, most reasonable democracies. And this is America. Now, the methods which I find interesting to biotech is we're looking at a technology biotech. If you don't appreciate it yet, think about it. Most of the medicines that we depend on were originally grown. Some of them can only be grown. Artemisin, insulin, they can only be grown. They are biotech. And without those, a couple of people in this room would probably be dead. And I'm, I'm, I don't mean to sound flippant about that. It's extremely serious. Because now, the ones that can be made other than by growing are made with oil. Oil's running out. Peak, oil, peak conventional oil was 2005. We're now hopping along on the fumes. What happens when the oil becomes so expensive that the medicines become impossible to make? Biotech is our future, and the cypherpunks were able to use all these amazing methods to tie, critically, uh, cryptography to free speech, which was an enshrined right by the UN. What can we do to guarantee that biotech isn't in the hands of someone else when our lives depend on it? Steve Kurtz experienced um, an unfortunate backlash when he was just doing art. His wife died, paramedics came around, they reported uh, some petri dishes in his house, the FBI came around, the FBI walked into his house, they talked about it. The FBI went away. They were like, yeah, he's just doing art. Then they came back in hazmat suits. I mean, this is crazy. They were out in the streets in hazmat suits, spraying down a beach after being in his house. They arrested him for bioterrorism. When that didn't stick, they tried to catch him for wire fraud. The judge threw it out. He made this exhibition out of what was left in his house. While in the streets, they were spraying down a beach and treating it like a biohazard. You'd think this is all above board, maybe a bit of a mistake. They were ordering pizza into his house. Is that a biohazard? Are they treating that seriously? So this was a, a, a political reaction to someone doing biohacking. And it may have been the first of its kind. Hopefully, it will be the last. But you know, it's led to us kind of trying to mitigate fear-mongering by creating bioethics codes. We've created two bioethics codes. 
that more or less are agreed upon by the whole DOI or biohacking community, more or less. That's two more universally agreeable pro uh, codes than academia, industry, or governments have ever agreed on when it comes to biosecurity. Um, sorry. So this is the big kind of crux for me, where I see these stories are colliding, and we can see the, the end game of one of them, and we can see how maybe we can try to at least reach that compromise. They had free speech to build on. They had an enshrined right in free speech. We don't have something so clear, and this actually kind of brings up something that's come up a few times, our human rights and our rights to creativity. We have a right to free thought, to freedom of thought, but thought is static. That's not really what being human is. We're not born with our thoughts, and we don't just die exactly as we started out. Our right to thought should better be interpreted as a right to inquiry. And if we follow that to its logical conclusion, we seldom come to an answer without applying it to a, to a solution. We always make solutions out of our answers. We don't just get the answer and go, oh, pity about it. So we need to have a right to inquiry, and we need to have a right to creativity. We need to have that as a right, that as long as we're not hurting anyone, we should be allowed to apply technology to better our lives or to preserve our lives. You should be able to make artemisin to save your life if it can't be provided by the government or by local corporations. People in Africa should be able to grow their own antibiotics and be protected from patent litigation or from lawsuits for doing so. And there's nothing that would stop them from doing that. They could make yogurt that is an antibiotic, so if their children get sick, they can make their own and give it to them. The big problem we have is getting the stuff on the ground. What's, the, what's that about? It's kind of typical in TED to, you know, to end with kind of saying, it's all taken care of itself, and like, just watch it, it's going to be great, come on for the ride. But actually, you know, the, this, this touches on broader stories. The story is not just of biohacking, but of any kind of human creativity. We don't yet have those rights to creativity. And for us to get the rights that will allow us to pin life-saving drugs, life-saving technologies, or just life-improving things that we want, or environment-protecting things we want, we need to have the right to human inquiry and human creativity. I'd be delighted to have them because I can guarantee that my passion and my career are somewhat guaranteed to me as long as I'm not stepping on anyone's toes or hurting them. But it's important for far more things beyond that, and I'd like to think that everyone here would agree we should be entitled to be creative. So try and help make that a reality. <laughs>